Welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, we're going to get a, an update on all things going on in the legislature. Well, there's not a lot going on, but we'll hear from two of the state's leading reporters on the budget and pensions and liquor, privatization, where all that stands. But first, the Auditor General of the state of Pennsylvania joins me, and we're going to talk about what else, pension problems, not just in the state, but in our municipalities as well. We'll do all that and more following these words. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Welcome back to the program. Well, joining me as often is the case is Eugene D. Pasquale. He's, the, he's Pennsylvania's Auditor General. He was a former member of the state legislature. Uh, General, welcome to the program. Uh, always a pleasure to be here with you, Terry. Thanks for having me. You know, my, my pleasure. All right, look. We hear all this news all the time about the big state pensions, right. you know, the state employees, right. the school teachers, somewhere I can't figure out exactly where, between 50 and $60 right. billion dollars right. debt due. Right. We don't often hear about, not hundreds, am I right about this, thousands of all these other pensions that the public is on the hook for, the ultimate, you know what I mean, ultimately has to pay for. That's correct. We have uh, fire, police, and non-uniform pensions throughout all of Pennsylvania by municipality, and in some municipalities that you'll end up having three and sometimes even four pension plans in every municipality. Now somebody tell, I read one where, I read a statistic where something like 25, you'll correct me, percent of them have 10, 15 people yeah. or fewer. What sense does it make to have a pension system or a pension plan with 10 or 15 people instead of merging them, or am I, am I off base, uh, or isn't that the problem? That is part of the problem. The bigger problem is that money was not set aside and because there was unrealistic expectation of what was going to be coming in. So not enough money was put into the system. So that's the biggest reason why you have it. But now you have a situation where in trying to fix it, you have all these different plans, all with different benefit levels, all over Pennsylvania. How do you and, make sense out of it? Oh, we, we've come I up mean, with- I mean, you can, but how does the average- For the average person, it's very, it's very challenging because you, know, you may live in a municipality that your pensions are fine, but three miles away from you yeah. are two municipalities that aren't, but if something goes bad there, it's gonna impact the whole region. Now, just so people realize this, we're talking about townships, boroughs, and cities. Right. The places where people live. That's right. <laughs> live in this state. And we have some municipalities that are in not just a little bit of problem, but in a serious problem. I think of Scranton. Scranton and, and Chester are both within a two to four year time frame of not being able to make payments on their pension plans. Which means the employees who are retired and collecting them there, there won't be enough money to pay that benefit. That's exactly correct. So having said that, the money would then by law have to come from somewhere. So you're going to either have, if this is not fixed, you're going to either have you know, property tax increases or layoffs to public safety. The number one job of Pennsylvania local government is public safety. Sure. And so, uh, but those retiree benefits minus a, a bankruptcy declaration are going to have to get paid. So that's why I've been pushing to A, make everyone aware of this problem, and B, try to come to some common sense yeah, solutions. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's over $7 billion, yeah. according to your Just audit, shy of right? eight, yes. Just shy of eight. And all right, well, let's t talk about this. We've got cities that have uh, you know, particularly cities, but other places right. that have other sorts of problems. They, you know, whatever it is, healthcare costs, right. we can go through the list of them, serious resource needs. How does this get fixed? Oh, number one, the, and this is going to sound odd for a lot of people, but Harrisburg, with all of its financial challenges, and they've been legion, the one thing that they have well-funded are their pension plans. Mm -hmm. And about 20 years ago, they decided to have the Pennsylvania Municipal Retirement System take over the administration of their pension plans. That means you have a more conservative rate of return, you put the right amount of money in, and you freeze your benefit levels as they are. And the pension plans that are managed by them are well-funded. We think that that's a direction that all these other distressed pension okay. plans need to go in as well. And you think that will work? It will work over the long haul. All right. Here's the problem, and we're going to run to a break. I want to talk about school pension, uh, the school audits that you've done. But here, here, here's the problem, it seems to me. None of the solutions I hear, and you just made the key, uh, you made the, the, the key point, long run. Right. Even when you're dealing with the two big pension systems right. involving state employees, right. school teachers, 
None of the plans, I don't care, Democratic right. or Republican plan, seem to solve the problem. You've got to go way out. Right. And yet the state could be paying in the next few years, $4 billion out of right. what now would be a $30, $33 billion budget, right? There, there are some things that I do believe can be done in the short term. However, I've, the, the point I've made publicly and even privately to people that on this issue is until you fix the long-term structural issues, it's actually irresponsible to put more revenue into the system because you may just make the problem okay. worse. All right, I'm talking, we'll come back. I want to talk about this. We're going to get into, th th this is a subject we don't often deal with in this kind of depth in here, and particularly where municipal pensions, but they have the potential to affect every single taxpayer. Would That's you right. agree? Absolutely. Every single taxpayer in the state. We'll be back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Please visit pahighwayinfo.org. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Welcome to, back to the program. I'm talking with the Auditor General of the state, Eugene DiBasquale. We're talking about something that, we, you know, we don't get into a lot on this program, but it does, it's, it, it has the potential to influence your pocketbook, as well as, I think, the quality of the services that you get out of, out of not just uh, the, uh, the state, but also the local municipality that provides you with essentials. Did I, am I right about this? Yeah, the number one job of local government is, is public safety. Yeah. It's fire and police protection, obviously your parks and other recreation yeah, activity. Yeah. And so if we don't figure out a way to fix the municipal pension situation, those services are, go are gonna be uh, basically decimated. You were making a point about the fix saying, putting all this money long-term may not be the best idea if we don't fix the right. short term. Is that the point you were yeah, explaining? Yeah, there's cities that. in the past of what they've done when they had a problem being underfunded is they'd float a bond and they'd put the proceeds in, but the structural changes weren't made. Then five years later, they were still back. They, they, the problem was even worse because now they had more debt. And then they had to float another bond. Then they had to, to float another, another bond. So our point is, uh, you know, my point specifically is, let's fix the structural issues. Get that to a sustainable point. Then we can have a debate about what's the best way to deal with the unfunded liability. Right. But you've got to fix the structural problems. All right, let's uh, let's get to uh, charter schools. As you right. know, charter schools are, are complicated right. and they're also controversial. Right. Many folks in school districts think they pay. You know, they have to pay for right. them. Uh, and there's other aspects of it that we don't need to get right. into. But what's the problem with the books? Right. You, you know, the, 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 go ahead. The, the traditional public school advocates and the charter school advocates both have a point. And that is the, the traditional public school advocates will say there is the same accountability that happens to public schools does not exist in charter schools. They are 100% correct on that. The charter school advocates will say a lot of people are choosing to come to us, which is providing competition and choice, which yeah. is a good thing. And they have a point there, too. The point I've advocated is let's do both. Let's make sure that there is that competition that forces sometimes necessary change to the traditional system, but let's make sure that they also have to operate under the same rules of right. accountability when it right. comes to public money and making sure the money's where it's supposed to go, which is to the kids. Okay, final, final, final question. Uh, with their audits, what's the difficulty? Uh, first of all, they have a lot of private Char We're talking about charter schools. Yeah, the private management companies are off books, so you can see what the payment goes to them, but we don't know what that, what that payment accomplishes. That's a problem. And also lease agreements, the buildings they own. We've seen about half of the charter schools have improper lease agreements, which means that basically somebody's getting rich off the taxpayers. So what you would suggest is, I mean, does this beg for a comprehensive reform Absolutely. of the charter school system? Not, as you point out, you say, let's keep it, but let's reform it. Correct. And, and uh, give me two or three ideas for the reform. They have to have a situation where on, the, on whoever owns the building 
you know, you're not getting improper lease reimbursements. If you own the building, you're not also getting a state subsidy to pay for the right. lease of that, what's called a circular agreement. That's number one. Number two, on the teacher certification rules, we need to make sure that those are actually enforced and not just sort of like some number right. that everyone kind of hopes for. Number three, and I think this is the key point, charter schools were established yep. to make sure that if there was something that was happening good in the charter school, that information would be shared with all schools so all the kids, in, Pen yeah. all the kids in Pennsylvania could right. benefit. That has happened a whopping zero times since charter schools were created. We've got to fix that. All right. Well, look, thanks for coming in. You'll come in from time to Absolutely. time, I hope, and keep us updated. All right. here. I don't even know how to get into what's going on in the state capitol with the budget, liquor privatization, and pensions. But Angela Columbus and Kate Giamarese are going to help us out. We'll be back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, check out ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, working towards a healthy Pennsylvania, and by the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance, representing companies involved in America's most affordable, reliable energy source. To learn more, visit PACoalAlliance.com. Well, the major issues before the state legislature and the governor are unresolved, that would be the budget, liquor privatization, and pension reform. Kate Giamarie, she writes with, for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, and Angela Columbus, who writes for the Philadelphia Inquirer, are joining me. They've been covering, I guess you've been covering what's not happened. Do I got that about right, Kate? <laughs> yeah, that, that so sounds about right. <laughs> All right, give us a quick update. So here we are. Uh, the budget's not done. The legislative leaders meet with the governor. A whole 30 minutes. Go ahead. We're, what's, the budget's not been adopted. They're, they're at loggerheads. Explain this. Well, as you explained, so the Republican-controlled legislature came to a budget agreement amongst themselves and passed it, sent it to the governor. He promptly vetoed it um, on Tuesday, I think, right. on the 30th. Didn't even really wait. He pretty much knew what he was going to do. Um, so now we're into July where we have no signed state budget. And as you suggested, that it doesn't really appear that we're very close to yeah. getting one anytime soon. Let's assure people the the Wolf administration went out of their way to make sure that there was no panic in the streets for okay. millions of people who get services, correct? Right. That's right. I mean, they put out a couple of letters to first off to state employees and they told them, look, you can show up to work and you will be paid. So you don't have the, the so-called payless paydays. That was kind of the slogan in 2009 when we had the last major yeah. impasse. Yeah. Um, but the reality is that the longer this goes on, um, there is the state's spending authority is affected and it, it's, it's curtailed. So you won't have cer certain services funded the, the longer it goes. And, you know, nobody can quite tell you that there's a magic date when right. something horrible <clears throat> happens. You but mean when the money runs when out the money and, run, right. and somehow some services don't get delivered? It's mostly social services, services right. money that goes to uh, nonprofits, nonprofits across the states. And if you have a contract, if you're a private vendor and you have right. a contract, that payment might be delayed. Is that correct? It, that's exactly mm -hmm. right. I was speaking earlier this week with some folks in Allegheny County who provide, like, for instance, services for the disabled. Um, and they, those folks were weeks ago preparing for the possibility of a budget impasse and extending lines of credit in case they might not be right. able to get yeah. paid by the state. And they were, um, frankly, very upset at the prospect of having to take out loans and pay interest. Um, because there might not yeah. be a signed state budget. Angela, does this, I mean, look, no, we, nobody wants anyone harmed. I don't think, right. you know, the services need to be provided. We all agree there. But is there a sense if there's no urgency, right. there's no compelling moment right. that this lingers on and lingers on and lingers on? The two sides seem very far apart. We'll get to the specifics right. of that. Is, is, does that seem possible that there's no sense of urgency? 
Well, there's no immediate sense okay. of urgency. I think the longer it, you, you get two, three weeks from now, you're going to start seeing the Wolf administration um, be, you know, get a little nervous about money not being able to go out to the providers that Kate just talked about. Um, and then there is, you know, I mean, uh, I don't want to be sarcastic or ironic, but, you know, the legislature doesn't have spending authority, so they are now operating with their reserves. reserves yeah. And at some point, those reserves and are going lot, to be depleted. There's right? a lot less of them now yes, than they correct. had uh, yes. a couple of years ago. There's something like half or maybe even less than that. Is that right? That's what I hear. Yes. I, and mm -hmm. I don't know the exact number, but I believe that's because of Governor Corbett. Right. Um, he cut their last, last, yep. last year, cut, finished the so cut um, significantly their reserves. Okay. All right, let's run to a break. When we come back, let's get into a couple of these issues that are, that are very divisive that the Republicans and the Democrats particularly don't agree on. When the legislature passed a, uh, the budget, passed a alcohol uh, privatization bill, passed a pension reform, you'd have to look long and hard to find Democrats who voted for it. Mm -hmm. I think the reporters here would agree. Mm -hmm. We'll be back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Inspired physicians committed to the good health of Pennsylvanians and the advancement of the practice of medicine. And by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Business Council and by the Pennsylvania Business Council Education Foundation. Journalist Kate Giamarese and Angela Columbus join me. We're getting into the budget, pensions, and liquor privatization, all of which are somewhere in the midst of a big controversy in Harrisburg. All right, budget, what's the big difference? Well, I mean, you have two groups who both feel like they have a mandate from the voters and they're ideologically pretty far apart as exactly. far as I can tell. I yeah. mean, the governor, you've, he's been very clear. He campaigned on, he wants to have a shale natural gas severance tax, fund use that to fund education. The legislature doesn't seem, you know, really yeah. like they're on board with that at all. Um, some modest increase in education spending, but nowhere near what the governor wants. Right, and also the governor has said he wants, you know, sales in, um, or I'm sorry, changes in sales tax and income tax. tax to for property tax, yeah. And, and that, uh, there's been some um, enthusiasm in the legislature for, you know, addressing the property tax issue, but I don't know that there's a lot of enthusiasm for uh, raising sales and income taxes. So um, from what I can tell, there are wide gulfs uh, between the two sides. All right, let's go to liquor. One side wants complete privatization, right. the other side wants modernization. Explain yeah. that to our well, people. Well, I mean, the real explanation is there, you know, it's very difficult to find the middle ground when you have a governor who says, I want to keep the state stores, and you have the Republicans who say, I don't want to keep the get state stores. Them. I want to get rid of them. We need, we need them to close down and get right. out of the business of selling wine and liquor. Um, you know, some people have floated the idea that you could have some middle ground in allowing supermarkets to maybe sell wine. Mm -hmm. um, right now, that's as, you know, everybody who buys alcohol knows that's in the purview of the state stores. That's where you go to buy your wine and your hard right. liquor. So that could possibly be a moder uh, middle so ground. So in other words, they mm -hmm. would keep the liquor store operation, but right. on the retail side, go and expand sales pretty right. And that's what Wolf wants, correct? Well, you know, Wolf, no, not, not really? necessarily. I think Wolf has said he supports, um, you know, making the state store system more efficient, okay. giving them longer hours, um, more, you know, more stores opening on Sundays um, and making it more convenient. Um, but, you know, he hasn't really sort of moved much beyond that. I got I, it. Yeah. But that could be an area for compromise. Absolutely, yeah. They keep, okay. No. All right, now we're going to the, the, the pension issue, uh, 401k style plan. That seems to be right now for new employees at the heart of the question, right? Now we're talking about the two big pension systems, teachers, school, school employees, mm -hmm. and state employees, and all their annuitants. Go ahead. Well, I would say similarly to the liquor issue, though, it, 
there's not necessarily like a lot of common ground because you have one side that just thinks the current system needs to be completely overhauled and changed and the other side that thinks like well the current system should you know that it really shouldn't be changed it just needs more you know money right. um middle I, ground there i don't know <laughs> that's why we still You're have both a budget shaking your head. yeah i mean i i don't for, dealing with current employees and past employees is a no-no and and the bill that passed the legislature Right. Pretty much just talks about a 401k style plan for new people. Is that correct? That is right. For new, mm -hmm. for new people. So I don't see, now in all, I have to point this out as a professor at Millersville. I was in the, I am in the state employees retirement system. I like to get that out, uh -huh. even though I don't have anything to do with what they uh -huh. right. do uh -huh. right, in the right. legislature. I don't take a position on it. All right, before I let you both go, we are waiting, I should say this, the public is waiting to learn what the district attorney of Montgomery County does with a grand jury presentment that, that suggested, that pointed out that the attorney general of the state, Kathleen Kane, misled people, misled the grand jury when she testified before this statewide grand jury some time ago. And this particular DA has to make a decision about whether to prosecute, is that correct? That's right. Now, we expect a decision at some point we think this summer, is that correct? Uh, yeah, she's officially had the case for about three months now and she's been reviewing it. And what we've reported is that um, she's been reviewing it and it also appears that she has um, collected some fresh new evidence, although nobody quite knows what that is. Right. Um, you know, we know that there has been uh, some movement in it because just uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, the district attorney's office of Montgomery County executed search warrants at the attorney general's office in Harrisburg, which in the it middle of the work like the day, second or third you know. time for them, right? Um, yes, at least the second. At least the um, second. She had done it a couple of months back in early April, I believe. So, you know, they, she is definitely, there are signs that there is a lot of work being done on this case. And, um, you know, I don't think from a political point of view that uh, the Montgomery County DA wants to wait too long. Because uh, she's a candidate for judge? She's a candidate for judge. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, I think that uh, even though you don't hear the public saying, oh, let's resolve this, right. there is the question of, you know, we, we really need to put a period on this story. Right. Either you're, she's going to be formally charged, charged or, or not. Or not. Yeah. 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 Before I let you before I let you go now the, the meeting next week I'm back on the budget they're going to meet next week again. They're going to meet next week I believe it's only staff, um, <laughs> and I mean I I it don't know I think we It doesn't seem like a recipe in, to get this done. Yeah. Well, I think we could be in for um, a long, a long summer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Kate gets the last word. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next week uh, for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, stay well.